Hi, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait just a couple of few minutes. Um, wait, um, some people that are joining in. The number of us participants. I think I think we're ready. Um, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Maria Fonseca, and I am a grant and associates here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And I would like to welcome you to um, this quality of life uh, applicant technical webinar. We want to walk you and guide you through the application and the process. Um, I am joined by my colleague, the um, Dan McNeil, he is the director of the Quality of Life Program, and Parul Patel, she is the Associate Grants Officer here, and this is our team here, the Quality of Life Grants. So they're going to be, um, they're um, going to be part of our webinar, and we're going to be answering questions. We're going to do things a little different this time when it comes to questions. We are going to go through the different um, sections of the presentation, and we're going to pause. And if you have any questions, you can submit it then. We're going to try to tackle a couple of questions just to be aware of uh, not going over time. But um, we are going to answer the questions that we want you to write in the Q&A so everybody can see and, and maybe it's a question that they might have to and benefit for that answer. Um, if you submitted a question when you signed up for the webinar, I have... Um, personally answer those questions through the email that you provided. But if anyone be, have any questions after the webinar, please, you can always send them to qol at reeb.org. Um, and this webinar is going to be available in our website in a few days. It's being recorded and it's going to be available. So for now, I'm just going um, to turn off my camera and share the slides with you. We are going to go over um, in this webinar, we, I want to talk to you about the Reef Foundation and the National Paralysis Research Center, which the Quality of Life Grants Program is part of. We're going to go over the application process. The, the, in, in this cycle, we are offering direct effect grants, priority impact uh, programs. We're going to go over how the review process and the grant selection takes place and how the grants are awarded. The Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation is paralysis focused, but it is important to know that um, our grant funding, it is targeted to projects that serve individuals with paralysis, their families and caregivers. The we uh, questions that we often get is, do you only um, fund projects for you know, spinal, cord, spinal cord injury? But we use a functional definition of paralysis, and um, which is detailed here. And we include other conditions at like um, traumatic brain injury, stroke, uh, cerebral palsy, spinal bifida. So while we consider supporting programs that include people that have career-carrying disabilities as well and inclusive community projects, projects must serve at least a minimum of three people live with paralysis and ideally a majority of the um, people that are participating in the project um, are living with some type of mobility issue. The National Paralysis Research Center um, opened its doors at in 2002, and we are funded through ACL. And our aim is today's care, tomorrow's cure, and we um, promote the health and the independence and the well-being of individuals living with paralysis by providing comprehensive resources, education, and services. We have information specialists, um, a peer and family support program, of course, our quality of life program, military veterans. All our services are provided for free. And um, all our resources are available online. Um, as you can see here, 
uh, the Paralysis Resource Center is that first call that is made when the loved one is diagnosed with paralysis. And um, we support you know everyone who contact us by offering all these different types of services that we have there. Um, information specialists, of course, QOL, the resource guide, um, spinal cord research, a peer family support program, Team Reeve, um, which is marathons are coming up for, you know, for Chicago and New York. We always have a presence there. We have a virtual community. We also have the Reef Summit um, that is um, happens every year. And this year actually is going to take place in March of next year. And it's going to be in Denver. So um, maybe we see some of you guys out there. Um, if um, the Reef Foundation cannot award grants to individuals, I know that we've got a couple of questions for that. But if you um, are looking for information and resources, our information specialists can help you identify these resources. Um, you can call us toll free or send us a question. We have a very easy online form. We just started um, to have a, ch um, a chat feature and that is banded from 7 a.m. I think to 7 p.m. at night. So if, if any time um, you have a question or anybody of your community members or people that benefit for your programs, just please know that all these resources are free and they're available on our um, website. And you can just, there's a form that you can go to and you can order that. We have um, the paralysis resource guide. It has guides available in English and Spanish and 10 other languages. And um, we have information on secondary conditions. We have wallet cards. And um, again, this is available for your organization and for those that you serve. The quality of life programs at the Reef Foundation was created by the late Dana Reeve, and it strives to empower individuals with disabilities and their, and their families by providing grants to nonprofits that improve quality of life through inclusion, access, independence, opportunities for community engagement, and other life enhance enhancing endeavors. Um, since its uh, inception in 1944, we have awarded over 44 million grants um, to more than 3,800 projects across the United States. Um, so the important dates for this cycle, as you know, the cycle opened on August 30th. Um, the proposals are due on, by October 8th. The external review um, is going to take place from October 21st to November 6th. Um, this panel is composed of people who live with paralysis or caregivers and families, and they um, they review these these um, these proposals, and they come back to us. And um, we have an internal review here in staff. The grant award the grants are awarded by the end of December, and the grant period will start on January first. Very important. Um, the quality of grant applications are available are now to be completed through our grant portal. Um, the Refoundation Online Grant Portal that's you know found in is our um is our grant um software that we use. Um, please make sure that you only submit one application per cycle. Also, um for one of the questions that was submitted with the registration, if you had applied um into an and you know before and you have been declined, can you apply it again? Definitely. So um, just remember that um, you can um, apply again, even if you've been denied or if you didn't submit a complete application for the last cycle. Um, before we move on to the application, I think it's very important that we um, that we talked about the new uh, building community capacity initiative. So basically, what this is um, refers to is to the fact that if you it's a new eligibility requirement, and it's very important that you understand that if you had applied before in the past and you have been awarded a grant, you have to wait a year from the time that the grant, the grant was closed. And you, um, we parole actually is the one that reviews all the reports, and you would have gotten a notice telling you that your grant is closed and the date as of that, and when you can reapply again. So after you get that document that your grant has been successfully closed, you have a year that you have to wait. And when you up, reapply, you have to reapply under a different tier or program type. For, so for example, if you applied under um, adaptive sports for equipment, you cannot apply again for adaptive sports. You have to apply for a different tier, like a facility modification or 
or some type of a, a different different project type that what you initially had um, applied in the past? The application tools, um, the grant application, the program guidelines, um, the people first language, the vi videos and tutorial, all of this is available in on our website at reeve.org, QOL. You can scan this QR code and it takes you there. It has um, it has great information and it has um, all this, you know, all the details that we're discussing here. So if you have any questions, just definitely please refer to to um to that. So for this cycle, you can apply for direct effect. And these are for projects um, that are 12 months. And it's there's a minimum of 5,000 and up to 24,000. Um, there's an interim, interim report that is due at six months and a final report that is due at 12 months. Um, these grants are for projects that are going to begin in January 1st of 2024. And um, direct effect quality of life grants fund a wide range of projects, including um, accessible beach, accessible community spaces, healthcare, media development. I mean, you can see all of them here. If you ever want to go and see um, projects and descriptions of past grantees, you can go to our website and you can see there um, all the different um, grantees and, and, and what we have in the project projects that we have funded. For this cycle, you can also apply for priority impact. Um, for a minimum of 25,000, um, tier two is up to 30,000. Um, as you can see there, assistive technology, disaster preparedness, respite. Um, just want to make up um, to bring to your attention when it comes to assistive technology, the purpose of this program is like equipment or software devices, eye gaze communications that assist people living with a disability. I know sometimes people put here medical equipment like wheelchairs, um, ramps, this is not, you know, the, the tier for that. Um, that will be more maybe of an, a direct effect grant, but assistive technology are more for these devices and software that, that can improve, um, you know, communications and um, disaster preparedness, respite caregiving. Then we have tier three, which is our racial equity, and those must be completed within 18 months, up to 40,000. The rural underserved and unserved, underserved populations, and tier four, which is the grant up to 50,000, that's for employment and nursing home transition. Um, they're very, um, they're, the guidelines um, go over um, what, what this covers. I, you know, it, it's kind of a lengthy explanation, but I think if you have any questions, just refer to the guidelines again, of course, also send us, um, send us a question. So if you're ready to um, to start your application, of course, again, you go to the portal, any questions, qol at reeve.org. And then just, um, we ask you to add um, administrator at grant interface to your acceptable email address list to avoid any um, having email communications from the Reef Foundation be blocked by spam. The administrator at grant interface emails are, thus, are, are coming directly from the online grant system. So now you're on the, you know, this first screen um, to set up an organization on our portal. I know I've gotten a lot of emails of people who already have an account and are having some trouble logging in. If you get that um, notification that there's already an account set up, please, you know, send me an email. I know that I... Um, um, there might be some um, people here that I owe an email to kind of uh, reset that. I, I apologize. I would have an answer for you by the end of the day today, but um, you have your all, you know, your login and your password. Um, just make sure if if you don't know um, what contacts might be set up, 
just send an email. Make sure that you include the, the um, EIN number because that way you can find your organization. We want to make sure that we find the right organization and, and assist you getting those credentials. Also, um, if you have a portal and if there's any kind of contact information or addresses changes, it's a good time to go and update it. It's very important that we have at least we you know two contacts for each organization. Um, and also when you're starting your dashboard and you're setting up your account, make just be very um make sure that the app that the name and all the document appears at a dozen guy star. That's why we go by. This is how we do um we we run a a um a guide start check and an IRS check. So it, um, we we want to make sure that the name and the, that EIN number and the way that it's registered, it all matches because that, you know, if you're awarded, that's um, the information that we go by to, um, to issue the checks. And then if there's a discrepancy, then it can take a little bit more time. Um, we're going to go over the application. We, we're going to go over it quickly. I know that you guys all have access to this, but um, the, if the print is a little small, I apologize. We just want to make sure that we walk through it. And um, and if you have any questions, um, you let us know. When you first come to the screen, um, you will come to you will come here, and you of course you have the option to apply for direct effect or apply for priority impact, the tiers, the minimums, the dates are over there. Um, when you start um, planning for your grants, just, just make sure, you, you know, be aware of the timeline, be aware of, of, of your budget. Um, we just wanna make sure that uh, we see sometimes issues where they might be like a delay on getting equipment or getting permits or if it's an outside project, just putting into account, you know, I mean, of course there's things that are, you know, beyond our control, but just want to make that you really take a look at the project and at the timeline and what you're funding and see where you fit, where it fits within these categories. Also here, um, you can preview your application and see the questions before you submit it or if you're working with someone else. And this Grub Grand Hub tab lets you, um, it, it's, it's, it helps you, it's an app where you can keep track of your grants and deadlines if you're applying to other organizations. So who is eligible to apply? So the first thing that the, uh, the, the, um, the organization is gonna ask you, and again, you know, nonprofits, with IRS 501c3s, um, tax status, municipal and state governments, districts, colleges, universities, tribal entities, and other institutions such as community health centers and veterans hospital. Who is not eligible to apply? Um, they're all listed here. Um, one thing that I just want to bring your attention, if you're not, if you have a current or open grant with the Re the Re Foundation, irrespective of what program or tier um, that has not met the mandatory 12-month waiting requirement to, to reapply, um, you're, you know, you can't submit an application. If you have a question about it and you're not sure, you can always, always email, but previously awarded grants, um, grantees have to, may apply for the cycle only after one year of the close of the prior grant notification and the grant closure by the Reef Foundation. Um, I don't know if there's, take a few minutes to see if there's, let me see if there's any questions. Um, um, can the direct effect grant be used toward equipment for a rehab facility? Yes, um, there's just, um, we, we're we gonna go over that uh, in a, in a few more slides, I just, you know, we, we can't um, fund projects that are for, for, um, for like physical therapy that involve physical therapies and OLT, but um, definitely we can, we, you know, we can um, towards equipment. Um, we are a nonprofit that provides grants to those living with paralysis with insurance stops paying for quality of life grant. Can we apply for scholarships? that would be given to recipients registered at other nonprofits for recovery services. 
the money would go to nonprofits, not the individual, and for the service that is chosen. Um, it says, I hope it's clear. It's not 100% clear. So if you can send me an email, we can, we can, um, we can answer that. Um, if our organization already has an account, but I don't personally have one, should I make my own new account? As long if there's, that's why I, ask, you know, we ask that you send your EIN number. If there's an ENA number that is tied to to the account, you have to use that account. If you have a different EIN number, then you can use then then um, then and that EIN number is not in the system, then you can go ahead and and set up a new account. And the other questions I have here is what's the original website for this application? Um, I think you see it there is at reeve.org. So you can see it there. Um, I am going to continue with the slides. I'll have the rest of the team answer the questions. Um, and if there's something that was not answered again, you know, please, please let us know. All of the, these are the eligibility questions that are in the application. Um, it's going to, of course, ask you and the what's not, you know, who's not eligible to apply is, and if you are based outside of the U.S., if one of the vendors is outside of the U.S., if it's for research, if it's for rehabilitation therapy, um, if there's any part of the funds that are going to be gifts for individuals. Um, if it's not an equipment that uh, provides independence, if it's for new construction, if it serves on less than three people, it gives you all of the reasons why the project might not be, is not con considered for funding. We also, this is very important, we cannot have money given to individuals, for example, to pay for, um, for respite care. We have when we have a respite grant, it's, it's it's through an agency. Money does not exchange between the individual and and the grantee. Um, we cannot reimburse travel directly. Um, we can you know cannot give like um, a card to or a gift card for somebody to to pay for travel or pay for travel for them. It's all do, done through a vendor. Um, we cannot um, on t-shirts or uniforms, we cannot fund um, research at, or rehabilitative therapy, like we mentioned before. Exercise opportunities, when they are facilitated by someone who, for example, has a bachelor degree in exercise or is a certified fitness instructor, that would be allowable. And things like, in, you know, sometimes we see applications and in the budget, if there is a camp or um, don't include, um, water or t-shirts or um if there's field trips food we we cannot we cannot cover those those expenses and again <laughs> all of this is what it looks like in the application um it is all explained there this is basically you know the guidelines so if you have any questions and you're filling out the application you can refer to it there equipment can be funded um, if it provides access and independence. Um, there's examples here like um, adaptive strollers that are used for a program and they're not given out to the individuals and remain on site. Um, another example is a transfer chair and a community pool, a stair lift, um, a scale. Um, it allows people to remain healthy. It, and equipment can be might be purchased under the nursing home transition program you can refer to the guidelines on that or what's allowable expenses of that program, but that's in the priority um, impact guidelines. And it just, you know, repeats it again here in the application. Another thing that we cannot fund is the development of prototypes, prototypes for the invention of equipment or other research and development activities. Um, we cannot fund construction of buildings and major construction. However, the funds might simply might support simply accessible modification to existing structures like playgrounds and trails and other things like that. Um, requested funds, like for example, to make a, a bathroom accessible if they already have an existing bathroom, um, you know, like the grab bars or sinks. We cannot, it cannot be 
a brand new bathroom. It could it just, or a, a major renovation of an existing bathroom is just to make that bathroom accessible. Um, if, for example, you're requesting funds for an accessible lift or an elevator, this will be allowable in the equipment that provides access and promotes independence, but we cannot fund you know, the whole excavation or construction of the elevator or shaft as that would be considered um, major construction. For again, in the for when it comes to playgrounds, um, it's you know modifications or or minor relocations of older, non-accessible playgrounds or parks are allowable. We cannot fund any playgrounds that will be entirely new, where a playground did not exist before. Um, many um, applications we see many applications for fully accessible playgrounds in school districts or towns that are currently have no inclusive and accessible option for children. If a school come to us with a proposal that say that they're completely renovating their non-accessible playground to make it fully accessible and inclusive, because they're going to replace the older playground, we can fund things you know like a point place or um, um, inclusive playground structures. If the school does not have a playground before and it's installing a brand new playground for the first time on the property, we are not able to fund that. If minor relocations are happening within the same property, such as if you're moving the playground to a more accessible location on a school grounds, that would be considered eligible as well. But relocations must remain at the same property. Once it becomes a change of address is no longer a, uh, considered a minor relocation. And um, again, this is where it's in the application if you need to refer to it. So if you list, you you read all of that and you have, so you confirm that you have read it, that you understood it, and you um, just gonna move along and say yes right here. And um, also note um, which kind of organization um, you are, So again, then we require that you confirm that, you know, the project will serve individuals living with paralysis. Um, here we need the project name and the project type. Again, if you're not sure which project type, I mean, I think it's self-explanatory, but you can always um, um, ask us. So here, for, when it comes to um, the project description, um, we just want to, you know, if you can provide a simple and short answer of the project, there's an example here of what we're looking for. Um, just outline the whys this is needed, what activities you're offering, and how the refunding um, is going to support this project. We suggest that you keep it simple, as other parts um, and project components are going to come down the line in the application, like the timeline and the goals are covered in different sections. For, so, for example, a great project description would be that you have two people living with paralysis and um, they are registered users at no cost and you're going to get this piece of equipment and there's no other equi similar equipment close by and it's going to provide, you know, X number of sections for people to be able to, to benefit from this opportunity mentally and physically and the, pro the equipment has proven a positive impact on the health and the fitness of the participants. Um, for the project goals, um, we want you to um, tell us what is that you want to achieve. Um, and we want you to it'd be to keep the goals simple um, and you know, maybe three of the major goals. And one thing that we want to uh, bring to your attention is like, for example, um, we see sometimes people who, uh, excuse me, organizations who are requesting funding. And one of the goals is to buy the equipment. Um, that is not, you know, the goal is not to, you know, not to buy the equipment, but what the equipment is going to bring to the community, what benefits it's going to have. So we, you know, keep it simple. Um, what is it that you want to achieve with this project and what is going to bring to the community that is not there at this time? For the direct effects, we want, you know, again, 
just want to make sure that you know that the and and you study your timeline and it's not going to take more than 12 months the priorities have different tiers as we went over before so um this is this is what we're going to mark there um the number of individuals living with paralysis um it's we want you to be conservative um sometimes people write um these numbers we wanted to you know for them to be realistic sometimes like for example there has there had been an, an organization who was basing their numbers as say for example they had a concert and that you know every seat was going to be sold at every performance yet we want you to be consistent because what you know in realistic because if you're awarded, the, these are the numbers that then are brought over to your reports and you have to report against this number. So if you had an unrealistic number and you said 5,000 people were going to be served, it's just the people, all of these questions relate directly to the project. Not when you think, when you think in terms of uh, who's participating, um, just be realistic and take into account, you know, things, of course, things happen, things change. But do not like inflate the number of of just put, taking into account every single participant that that has the possibility to attend. And again, you know, just let you know the underserved population that's going to be served, the age of the participants, what the outreach, um, how are you going to make everyone um, know that about this project? How are you going to promote it? If you need assistance in determining um, the number of people living with a disability in your area, here are some of the websites that you can use. And there are, you know, there are links there. For the um, evaluation, you just need to, you, you need to identify the approach that you're going to take to achieve the expected goals and outcomes um, based on what you expect to achieve through this project, how you, how you measure the benefits, and the example is here from before that if you if your goal is to serve 20 people with paralysis and at least nine of the participants will report improved quality of life, then your evaluation methods could be that you use a registration form of the people who participated in the class and you have an idea of um, and then your final report would say that you offer it to 20 people will, willing, you know, living with paralysis. And uh, of those 20 participants, they completed the survey. And 95% of them said that they reported a marked improvement in the quality of life. So this is something that, you know, that is going to, to be required. Of course, later on when, you know, when you have your reports and we would, you know, compare to the statements. We want to know if um, use this information, when, you know, when reporting to ACL. So we just want to make sure that you complete the status of your MUA or MUP status in geographic area. The amount requested, um, again, keep in mind the minimums that we have and the maximums for each tier. The proposed project budget, we're going to go over the budget in a little bit, but it's very important that you use um, the file that it's here. Don't um, use the Excel, Excel, Excel file that it's available here in the application. And when you come, when you, um, when you fill out that file is going to have, um, we'll see it in a, in a little bit. Let's see. Um, we'll go over it in a little bit. I'm, we, we're going to get there. I apologize. Um, so what it's allow, you know, what is the fun? The fun part is all the things that we can fund. So if this is your first time applying, you'll be surprised at just how many different project categories and um, we fund every year and that how funds can support a wide variety of of program, you know, a program expenses for different programs and services. Um, so personnel, consultants, entry fees, transportation, facility, travel reimbursement. When, if you are requesting travel in your budget, um, please, you know, refer to this. This is what we have to go. We, we go back and we, and we check. I know that sometimes people will write just travel and just one blank line, but we want to see you know, five people are traveling to, you know, X, Y, and C for, for this um, program at 500. You know, we want to see, we want to be able to tie your travel line to these, um, 
to these to these numbers here that are um, required from um, for any um, as part of our federal cooperative agreement. And these are the limits. So we want to again, we want to be able to go back and see and see it match. There is a indirect cost that is allowed that is not more than 15 percent. This is a um, a new um, rate that is um, it's been negotiated. Um, however, if your organization has a different rate, then you have to provide us with the NICRA letter. Um, and please um, just send it with your application when you are, you know, when you are sending in your your um, your documents. Uh, of course, prog programmatic expenses directly related to serving individuals are in their, and with paralysis and their families are considered more favorable than operation expenses and or large capital projects. Um, I think what I think it. I think it's going to work a little better if we just, um, I was just gonna ask Dan and Perul if you could just answer the questions as they come in. I think it's just going to be a little harder to to stop and 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 for this, you know, to keep an eye on time. So if you could just um, answer those questions in the Q and A, um, just to make sure that, that we address them all. Um, this is what the project budget template looks. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Again, please use this one. Um, put the name, please put the name of the organization, the name of the project exactly as you filled it out in the application. So they match the amount that you're requested from the Freed Foundation and what your total project budget is. This is the form. Um, you itemize every budget, every, every line. Uh, all the subtitles are there. I think it's very self-explanatory. I know there's a reporting video on the website. So if you have any, if you wants additional information. When you are putting equipment, if you can just itemize it, you know, how many, how many the cost, do not include taxes, list if there's any any shipping, please list that, list that there. What we want to see is this project budget, their narrative, their narrative maybe and the narrative and the vendor quotes, everything matches together that we can follow it. Um, we looked at the budgets very um, with a lot of detail. So it's very important that you feel you fill this out as detailed and as clearly as possible. That we can see, for example, if you have an equipment here that you're requesting, that we can see in the narrative that you have described that this is what you're going to get, and that we can go to the vendor quote and we're going to see how it all matches and ties together. If there's a funding gap, this is going to calculate it automatically and we just um want to know if are the fundings committed or are they pending and sometimes we go back and if we see a big discrepancy and we're not sure where we are with for the rest the funding of the rest of the project you know we will we will contact you but just um let us know how much or where it's coming from and what the status of it is The budget narrative, um, again, is, um, excuse me, okay, <laughs> hold on one sec. My apologies. Budget narrative must include a description of and um, of each budget category and a line item presented in your proposed budget. All the expenses are listed on the budget template and should clearly match the items in the narrative, like I mentioned before. 
um, is important that um, sometimes you, you'll see the, the narrative has a heading and it has, it has an explanation and then below that, that you complete uh, that section. The vendor quotes are required for all of the equipment purchases and consultant contracts. They need to be um, within three months of when you completed the application. So um, it's very important that you include the vendor quotes, that there is no sales tax included. Um, the project contingency, it's we want to know um, if we are not able to fund the project, what happens if the refundation can't can fund it, if you have other ways to fund your project. Any additional materials can be uploaded here. The mission statement should be a list of who you are and what you do and how you do it and the reason that your organization is in place. Description of your organization and if you're as one and also if you're a center for independent living. It's very important if you're requesting $25,000 or more that you provide a valid SAM.gov. These are gonna be for the priority impact um, grants, which uh, it's gonna be all of them because the minimum is 25. And if you are awarded, you have to submit the most recent 990 for the organization at the time that you receive your grant agreement. If you already have a SAM um, unique ID, you will need to include it um, in the information section. If you don't have one, we urge you to apply immediately as is a process that sometimes takes some time and we need that we need that number as soon as possible. We have some general funding, federal funding questions. They're um, self-explanatory. Um, we want to know if you're a uh, if you have applied to us before, if you have received a grant before, and how did you learn about this opportunity? You can save your application and come back and work on it again, or you can submit it once you submit the application um, and you hit this button, you're going to get an email from the grant portal saying that the application has been submitted successfully. The uh, awards, the notification of awarding the funds is going to be done by email through the grant portal. Um, the Upon notice of the award, um, you receive an intent to accept, and there you put all the information of um, where the grant agreement has to be sent to and who is the person that is designated to sign for that. And all that information is going to be there and where the grants checks are going to be um, sent to. Um, we would send you a few weeks af after that, we would send you information on how to publicize the award and a press release template. Um, and also we feature quality of life grantees in our social media on the, and on the website. So we can call on you to provide stories and photographs and we can share that um, for a community. Again, we encourage you to uh, utilize all of our resources of the Reef Foundation and follow us at the Reef Foundation on social media. If awarded, grantees must submit progress report to the Reef Foundation. Um, this is very important, an interim report at six months and 13 months and priority depending on the tier. There are um, two checkings, an interim at 12 and a final at 25 months. And it's very important. That's why we these reports are required. And um, we want to know and how the um, your project is doing. So it's very important that you submit these and you submit them in a timely in a timely fashion. In um, we cannot, I know sometimes people have questions, oh, you know, about their grant or their applications. We can't um, give any type of comments or, you know, program direction. We can just give you answers based on our guidelines. 
And um, because given any feedback would be providing unfair advantage to some grantees over others, we have a statement of objectivity regarding the grant decisions, and this is available on our website. Um, but if you have any questions regarding um, the program itself that we can answer, but in terms of, of, of specifics, we can't, we can't do that. Um, we have a little time. Let's see if there's any, are there any questions that I think all the questions have, have been answered. Um, let's see. I don't know, Perul and Dan. Yes. Um, we do have one question from Nicole Castillo um, for items that may be rented out to the participants are ramps and stair lifts permissible? That one, because we don't get much of, of items that are rented out. You know, we I know we do provide loan, loan closet items. Um, but, if I may. Yes. Um, and so renting uh, the proposed equipment is not allowable. We can only allow loaning where there is no income incurred and the loan has a maximum period of 90 days. Uh, you can repeat the loan, um, but they must return it within 90 days, wait for a day. If no one else takes it, then they can uh, borrow it again, but the term cannot exceed 90 days. ALS is an exception. And I mean, we, we um, you know, we have funded projects which are like maybe a ramps in a public place, but not a ramp um, for an individual, unless it's in a, in a loan closet. Let's see. Can you request, I have a question here. Can you request a direct effect grant for an ongoing project? Yes. Yes, it depends, you know, on the project, but yes, it doesn't have to be a project that, um, yes, a lot of the projects are ongoing, like if, if it's therapy or um, or uh, education in the project is ongoing, yes. Just one clarification on that, Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do retroactive billing. Mm -hmm. So if the project is ongoing and there's a second phase to it, that's allowable. But if something has already transpired and has completed, it is not allowable. So there's a, another question about a project that was completed in 2020. The reapplication eligibility question for the five-year uh, rule only applies to all those grants that were awarded in 2021 second cycle and 2021 priority impact first cycle and onwards to current. So if you have a grant or if you were awarded anything before that, that um, tier or the project type category is not applicable. It's free reign for those applications. I hope that's clear, Rick. Let's see. Um, there's a question here regarding transitioning individuals from a nursing home. Can funds be used to purchase the items that they will need for their home, like bed and kitchen items? Yes. And for rental deposits. Yes, we um, that is allowable for the transition grants. There's a question related to admin costs. Um, I know we have a direct uh, policy for indirect costs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, we need to understand this question a little bit more clearly as to what you are defining as admin costs. So please, if you can write your question to QOL um, at reef.org and we'll be happy to get back to you. Mm -hmm. Is can you apply for both direct effect grant and the priority impact grant? No, you can only apply for one grant 
um, at a time. So there's a question here for how do you determine the target population if your project will be open to all community residents to utilize? So you are applying for a grant at a national paralysis resource center. By target audience where, or target population, we are referring to those individuals with paralysis, living with paralysis, or a spinal cord injury. And please refer to our definition of what constitutes uh, paralysis. Hmm. Let's see. Let's see another question. If a, there's one here. If a ramp is needed on, a, on the home that someone is transitioning to, oops. Just, oh, sorry. That's all right. What, the, the, the last part of it was, would that be allowed? Yes. Did you already respond? Um, no, I didn't. I did not. I was moving it over. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, would that be allowed? Okay. Um, ramp to a an individual. As of now, we're looking at these things on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's been approved in the past on an exception basis, but generally speaking, um, rent, um, not rented, renting is definitely not allowed. Loaning a ramp, uh, ramp is allowed, but as a permanent fixture to someone's uh, home is not allowed. Um, I want to clarify Brittany Aquartz. Um, question to clarify, can equipment purchase be used for therapy or only for exercise? Um, only for exercise, it can't be used for therapy. May equipment be purchased to facilitate the ongoing operation of the organization's program? If the program that you're referring to is is the program for which you are applying, then yes. Um, another question from Nicole Castillo. Um, for loaning, is there a limit on the types of ad adaptable items? I would assume no on that one. No. It depends on the need of the target population. If you're in the business of assistive technology, for example, then you can get you can have a whole slew of assistive uh, technology equipment pieces that you can purchase and in you know have as part of your loan closet. So there is no limit. There's a question about with from Elizabeth from a public library is inst installing an elevator for the first time. This is new construction, but the majority of the cost is funded by the state grants. We just need to close a gap by raising an additional 150. Will be will be will we be eligible for grant for part of that? Not if it's new construction. May equipment be purchased if so. I think, yeah, I think um for um rule answered um Gilbert's Gilbert's question. I did. Um I'm still a little confused about from Heather about community pull lifts, stairs, and transfers, chairs being tier one or two. I was thinking tier two. It's really a tier one. It's um it's not a priority impact uh, grant, uh, so you're right. It's it's a direct effect of tier one, Heather. Well, um, that depends, right, Maria? Because yeah, uh, where it's, it's located, part, also. Yeah, if it's part of your rural uh, priority impact application, then it would be priority impact, right? But she said tier 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 two, which is um, it's not existent technology, but if it's in a in a like Harul just said, like if it's in a in a rural community then, or um, it could be um, a tier three. Michelle 
we add it to exercise pools to our program? Can we purchase a lift to get the people in and out of the pool? Definitely. <laughs> yes. We have individuals living with paralysis who are no longer approved for the number of caregiving hours that they really need to avoid to go into a nursing home. Could caregiving respite funds be used to pay for caregivers for hours that Medicaid does not cover? Um, yes, but as long, like I mentioned before, as long as it cannot be given to the individual directly. see we're getting so um i think so andrew yeah andrew i think andrew has been up there we haven't answered that question yeah. so if Look, you can take that one parole looking at priority impact rural access telehealth we have online fitness programs that currently serve people across the u.s and beyond and we want to promote these programs for greater reach with this count as telehealth um so if this is an online, uh, it's pretty hard to prove that this is rural access only, right? So it depends. Um, I think this warrants a conversation. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, generally, based on what I'm seeing, yes, it would qualify as telehealth. So... To clarify, from we are a philanthropic arm and a 501c3 of a nonprofit. We, as the philanthropy, cannot apply on behalf of the nonprofit. We name we we are the fiscal sponsor for it, but for a nonprofit, no, not a fiscal sponsor cannot apply. The nonprofit can apply, but not as a fiscal sponsor. No, fiscal sponsors um, cannot, um, are not eligible for fund, for, to apply for funding. But, um, all right, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you are just a foundation set up to raise funds on behalf of a nonprofit. In that case, we wouldn't consider that as a fiscal sponsor relationship. Therefore, you would qualify. So uh, I, I think, think Maria, let them reach out to QOL. Yep. And we'll get more clarification. Um, I see a question from Gilbert Frost. Is the rental of portable toilets allowed for event programs? I'm assuming you mean um, accessible um, portable toilets. That would be a yes. Are you are they being rented or yes. or loaned? Rental is not allowed. Real okay. So we, so we are at 3.59 right now. So um, we're going to end the webinar. Again, if you have any questions, if there's something that um, that you need clarification, send us um, a question to qol at reeb.org. And we look forward to um, receiving your submissions all by October 8th. And thank you so much for um, for participating. Thank you, Dan, Parul, and the interpreter, and Hannah behind the scenes. So thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>